Welcome to Show Studio. It's our very last roundup panel of the season, and we've just had our menswear discussions, and now we're moving on to talk about couture, which might seem like an odd jump from menswear to couture, but that's actually how the season works, where the Versace show is actually the same night as all the, all the menswear show, is really not giving the fashion pack much time to sort of rest or reevaluate. Um, but it was an exciting couture season for lots of different reasons. And um, we've talked, actually Alex and I were talking the other day about how it was one that kind of split critics. People interpreted it in lots of different ways, down from the individual shows right through to kind of what, what the vibe of the season was as a whole, which is hopefully going to make for a really interesting discussion. Um, I've got some amazing panellists with me from all across the industry um, to help discuss what we saw in Paris. But before we start our, our dissection, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Shona. Um, I'm Shona Marshall and I'm a curator at Somerset House. I'm Alex Fiore, I'm the fashion editor of The Independent. I'm Susie Lau and I'm a fashion blogger of Style Bubble and a freelance journalist. Alex's shoes are really hurting, so if he's very critical, it's because he's in a really bad mood. I feel like we should do that little disclosure. He's going to be like, everything was terrible this season and I'm going home. Um, to kick things off, I'm going to go, i actually start with you, Alex, because I want to know, we what was the highlight of the season or was there one or what was the kind of what did you come away from couture thinking um i've been struck the last couple of seasons and, and this one as well with how synchronized in their kind of thought processes carl lagerfeld uh, chanel and raf simmons at dior have been um Interesting. last spring it was about trainers last winter it was about reinterpreting these kind of historical tropes and trying to make them modern finding the modernity in history um, and this time and it sounds quite fast out but this time they both focused on flowers um, but it, it, for me it's very interesting to see the two people that are leading the two biggest couture houses in Paris um, have that kind of that sort of alliance of of inspiration and also to see how they interpret it in different ways I find that quite fascinating how do you think they're in tune are they secretly collaborating so that no, I, 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 I really don't know why they're both alighting on the same thing you could also say that um, you know last autumn winter I felt like um, you know Cole staged the ready to wear in a supermarket and Raf's was about women on the street that's why he had multiple women in the ready to wear show coming out at the same time mm. and so both of those felt like it was about what every every woman wears every day. Mm. Um, I think they're in tune because they're both really great designers and really great designers, I think, should be in tune with what's happening at, at the moment, what's happening in the world at the moment. Mm. And I think that's why we get them synchronised together like that. Historically, do we see that, Shane? Do we see periods where designers all touch on a similar ethos? Because obviously from your history, you're like, please don't ask me this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a bit surprised to be here, generally. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course. Mm. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, it, it, it's a spirit, isn't it? That's what fashion is. Mm. It, it, it picks up on something and I think people can't help but be inspired by similar things, be it a piece of artwork or a film that's just come out that mm. discusses something or someone. It, it, it's almost the zeitgeist that, that then you all think, oh, wow, I was just thinking about that. And I think that, that it can't help but mirror one another mm. in that sense. It's probably completely coincidental and I wonder how they feel about that in in mm. that sense you know you writing that you can see similarities in their collection perhaps they don't see them themselves I don't mm. know mm. I didn't see it so much I mean obviously the, the you know a flower motif for spring no flowers for spring exactly <laughs> exactly not ground <laughs> not that groundbreaking and to be honest they approached it you know the themes at hand in such different ways and I, I do feel like Raph uh, Simmons in particular was still kind of riffing off of this idea of looking at the past but mm. not looking at it in, in the way that he ought to and sort of tackling this kind of um, thing that he thought he never would do which is you know look at past and you know look at the history of, mm. of, of the house and, and just in general so yeah I think he was on a slightly different path and then and then actually for me um, Carl was doing something that was a bit of a respite from last season's ready to wear you know the feminism thing mm. and going back to a theme that was you know really pleasant lovely no one is going to argue that that is not a, a beautiful collection. But I didn't feel like, did you, maybe this is my interpretation, like it's interesting that you say pleasant because 
I do agree that it felt like a reaction to the to the kind of the feminist protest, but I felt like it was almost as provocative because it was almost like deliberately saccharine and you know it was so feminine and sort of sweet and pretty that it didn't feel like it was just kind of a palate cleanser in a pleasant sense. It felt like it no, was kind of forced femininity. It wasn't a palate cleanser, but the theme itself and the way it was presented, mm. I, I I don't know. It just felt like a a bit of a like a Chanel crowd pleaser. Okay, that's and interesting. That, but you know, it wasn't that he wasn't doing any. It wasn't that he was just doing, like Chanel by formula. Yeah. It was that he was changing up the silhouette. You could see it in like you know the crop tops, the kind of short skirts, those like kind of leather socket boots. I still mm. think it looked really, really fresh and different. Um, but obviously, in comparison to uh, what he was dealing with in the last Ready to Wear, mm. it's it's definitely. Uh, oh isn't that lovely yeah and think like how could you look at that and and especially when you look at it up close all that kind of 3d embroidery yeah. all the you know and again obviously amazing craftsmanship how could you not like that yeah that's interesting it's interesting that alex said right at the start this idea that you know raf and and carlo are the kind of the leaders of couture and obviously that makes sense because of chanel and deal being such such mighty houses but would you would the rest of us agree that that's where the most exciting innovations in couture are happening or are there others who, who we think are kind of pioneering even if their house isn't as big? I mean I think with the thing that you just touched on Susie is, is something that I've written about couture which is a lot of the time it's 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 not about oh look what you could wear it's about oh look what we can do mm. it's much more about showcasing the techniques and that's how haute couture separates itself out from, from ready to wear, which is increasingly you know, heightened in, in terms of um, elaboration and in terms of creating dresses that cost incredible amounts of money that very few people will buy. Mm. But there is still a line that ready to wear can't reach. And I think haute couture is about pushing beyond that line. And it's about saying, look, here's a dress that's made completely out of flowers that we made out of feathers, or mm -hmm. here's a dress out of hand woven lace. Mm that we've then, you know, hand dyed or, you know, a dress that's been specially pleated, that's made out of strips of ribbon. It's about pushing that technique to a point that, that can't be emulated. But it's interesting you say can't be emulated just because it is definitely the case that we're not seeing any of that ready to wear. I ask because you've worked in the McQueen archive, so obviously you've spent a long time doing that. And I think some would argue that we are seeing stuff that is as but that's done. why that's why couture is being pushed even further because mm -hmm. ready to, like I said, it's ready not. to wear is embroidered, but there, there is a level that it, it literally will not be able to because of because of the price point because haute couture doesn't make money because mm. haute couture you know the but profit then margin. Neither do the McQueen show pieces, and, and that arguably what could be called haute couture. To be fair, there's mm. a lot there's a lot of thing, a few things in ready to wear that do cross over into but that I think even they, if they don't name themselves. But I think way. they would have a ready to wear markup. Whereas with haute couture, the profit margin they make on it is one percent. Mm. Like that's that's just if you're selling a couture dress, that's how much profit you make on it. Mm. They're definitely different though, the McQueen pieces mm. from that. Tell us more. They're not hundreds and hundreds of hours. The Lee McQueen, because I think Sarah Burton is very different in that sense. Yeah. She did those big frocks. That was her kind of in not her only contribution, but that's always kind of her stamp, and you can see yeah. that. In uh, the collections up until, you know, she took over as creative mm. director. But they're different, they're big and they're enormous and they have real great thought and concept. He is a master tailor. Um, but they're not the same as making flowers out mm. of feathers and yeah. spending hundreds of thousands of hours focused on, uh, you know, square centimetres of, yeah. of, of a dress like Valentino when yeah. we, I, I went to, to the atelier in, in Rome it was it, it is something else they wear white coats these women are heavily skilled trained have been you know apprenticing since very early ages to become the, the geniuses that they are in the way that they work with different fabrics to create clothing but mm. The McQueen thing is different, I think. It's 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 tortured and it's fantastic and it's part of a bigger story. And they they don't go into production really. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. And they're more, I think, about exerting this flamboyancy within that's a catwalk show and within a part of that narrative which I'm obsessed with and love. And this is something else. This is 
I always think it's so flat to see them yeah. on mm. any screen ever, you mm. know, it, be it at home or here or, mm. it, you know, I think film is a little better so yeah. you can see them moving, but seeing the actual garment is just It was so true with else. Chanel, even just people's Instagrams were yeah. close to the mm. garments were so beautiful compared yeah. to the catwalk imagery. I agree and I saw a few of them and another's just done a really lovely thing with close-ups of the couture yeah, it's and really I think beautiful it's really well. beautiful and um, it's trying to get those ideas and communicate those things out to people to help them understand the amount of work that goes into these pieces. I think well, it's I really think interesting. a lot of you know Valentino in their show notes. I you know sometimes I, I find it a little bit pedantic, but they do say how long it takes to make 3, various garments. Hours. Three thousand, you know, three thousand hours to embroider a Polinaire poems on a dress. Um, you know, to and it it sounds very you know they end up becoming these figures, but you mm. you know. The Chanel wedding dress took, f the, the thing that I kept hearing is that the Chanel wedding dress is trained, took 15 women a month to embroider. You know, that can't be emulated. You know, something can look like it in ready to wear and something can be hand worked in ready to wear, but th th that amount of work, that mm. amount of focused, specialised work isn't possible because when you start to put, you know, when you start to try and commercialise it at a ready to wear point, the, the cost is astronomical. Mm. But it's also, I think, they're very proud mm. and it gives those women a voice that's their piece they're so proud of the work that they've done mm. um valentina calls them loragazzi the guys mm. and they all came over um when we did valentina master of couture at sunset house a good few years ago now and they helped sew dresses that needed it or mm primping and um, you know puffing them up and they called Valentino il maestro and maestro is coming you know they're so proud of their jobs that they want to make it look perfect and I think that's actually those statistics is quite a nice way of giving them a little mm. kind of thank yeah. you well done you know well it's something I was going to ask is if you know if couture and if designers and us the fashion press and people who work on exhibitions you know are we doing enough to communicate how this process that goes behind couture? Because Alex, if your argument, you know, is that it's so much about craft and that it is, you know, that it cannot be emulated and ready to wear. Do you think we are making, you know? I don't think you can. I you think can't. it's. I think you. There's only two ways. I might have said this on a panel before. I think I've definitely written it. Is that I think the only two ways to actually understand couture is to make it or to yeah. have it made for you. Yeah. Those are the only two ways that you can understand it. There's absolutely no way. And when, when you go in and someone says this took 350 hours and this took two, you know, 2,000 hours, they just, as I was saying, they just become numbers. numbers yeah. It becomes meaningless yeah. to actually say, you know, and you can't quantify that amount of work. You can't quantify that amount of time. Mm. How many people, you know, is it 2,000 hours with one person or did you have 10 people working on it? For, you know, it starts to become these weird sort of mathematical formulas to try and figure out how things were made. Mm. And, you know, the things that I find amazing is when you see people, you know, the way that couture ateliers actually work to, to physically make garments. You know, they don't work with flat paper patterns. They drape on the stand, they pin and drape, and, th and then they cut a pattern from three-dimensional modeling. Mm. When you see people physically working in that kind of way, it's, it's exceptional. And actually, that's why it isn't ready to wear. They operate in a, you know, people can use sort of couture techniques in ready to wear, but, it but it ends up becoming a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. The elasticity of a hand stitch is totally different to the tension of a machine stitch. Mm -hmm. So the actual stitching of the garments mm -hmm. is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also, you know, there's that question of the the sort of, the knowledge of the of the technicians physically making it. Um, you know, you look, look at what Dior and what Chanel do, and the the technicians they have are, are Dior and Chanel technicians. They're people that, you know, there, there are guys at, I think he's at Chanel now, who tra a guy called um, Michel Pacquin, who was at um, Givenchy, he trained with Balenciaga. You know, there's people like that who have that train of, of that train of training, <laughs> where, you know, where they've actually, they've grown up. There's, um, I saw an advanced screening of the Dior documentary, and I'm not sure what I can say about it, but there's a fantastic moment when the people in the atelier say, it doesn't matter who the creative director is, we work for Michel Dior, mm -hmm. which fits with what you were saying about that pride in what they're doing, but also 
about the fact that these people are, are operating in these houses and have this specialised knowledge that is tied to these houses. Mm. And it, it can't be emulated because those people are physical people that are there. I agree with you, it can't be emulated, but then you think, you know, to keep those people, to give, ensure those people always have a living, it is so vital that, you know, people come to understand how relevant mm. and important couture is. So that there has to be a way of communicating it better. But, but I think people do. I think uh, the people yeah. with the money do, you know. Um, the, the Chanel collection goes to New York for clients, it goes to the Far East, it's coming to London mm. this time for the first time for, for clients to order. Mm. Um, Donatella Versace says that people see her collection on the internet and are, are ordering. You know, I think people with a lot of money understand why these clothes cost more than other clothes and actually why they're worth what you're paying for them. Um, mm. And it kind of doesn't matter if we understand it because, you know, I'm always sat there and I know I'm a man. And these mm. clothes aren't made for me, but I'm always sat there thinking these clothes aren't made for us. We're not, you know, they're great to look at, but really these are about satisfying other people, people that have demands that I can't possibly mm. comprehend. But people that have to have a private jet. It's the only way they could possibly travel anywhere. People like me. <laughs> <laughs> but from a branding perspective, I mean, yeah. I still think mm. it is incredibly important that these shows are not merely just showcases for their clients, but for their general audience the people that are going to be thinking about buying the lipstick the handbag yeah. and you I, I definitely seen in the last few years that like the houses like Dior and Chanel have been a lot more open about about their processes just even getting taking people behind to their ateliers mm. doing a lot more behind the scenes work to yeah. convey and also taking on you know like when they do like the Dior exhibition that they had in Japan, for instance, they had mm. somebody from the atelier there sort mm -hmm. of communicating like how they did uh, a certain kind of stitching, a certain kind of uh, pattern cutting. So I, I think even though it is commu you know, communicated to a very select audience on a wider scale, mm. the couture collections do become like their USP as it were, because for instance, like Chanel will always say, like, we're the oldest atelier and we mm. do things the, you know, this the certain way. And um, that is communicated to a general audience that will be thinking about, you know, the other purchases that make, you know, mm. makes but their bread and butter basically. Do mm. you think as well that's a kind of, I wonder with, with that sort of stuff, it, if it is a sort of justification for it? Because I always think when I'm at, at watching a couture show, it's much easier to justify the cost of a Chanel wedding gown that you know it is tremendously expensive because it has so much work that you can physically see as opposed to you know a very simple suit or a very simple dress I think it's almost with somebody sewing and with more behind the scenes it's almost like justifying you know to say this is the difference between an elaborate mm. piece of couture and an elaborate piece of ready-to-wear this is why it will cost so it much more. It is justifying it but it also makes them incredibly special like I'm mm. one of a handful mm. of of you know houses and it is only a handful now that can that can do that and that makes them more special as a brand in other respects as well mm. Mm. it's interesting that Alex your assertion that couture you know doesn't really matter if we understand it it's just for the clients because there are certainly houses that that we see on the couture schedule who I would argue that their couture is not there for clients. It's not even there to be sold. It's there as, as, as kind of as Susie implied, it's there as an advert for their perfume or for their mm. lipstick, and it's almost a vanity project in some ways. Do you not think? Yeah, that's but okay? I was I was saying we you know we don't need to understand why something costs a lot of money, because that's for the client. That's what I meant. Mm. Like whereas, and there are you know when you look at things like the fact that Victor and Rolf are stopping doing ready to wear exactly, yeah. and mm. Gauthier is stopping doing ready to wear that is them basically saying we don't in a way we, we don't need to sell clothes. but they're both comparable because I would argue that Gauthier has more clients than perhaps Victor and Rolf would do you not think? yeah no I know Gauthier does sell clothes but I think to be consciously scaling back it's we don't need to we're not making money from these clothes because mm. they're really not mm. you know if Gauthier is selling couture they're not certainly they're not going to be selling enough to pay for the show yeah you know as, a, as, as an example um, but yeah. they both have best-selling perfumes you know yeah. mm. but I did I've, I've written something about it actually for Monday and, and for, for our Monday paper and I said you know that's not a new thing Yves Saint Laurent did that and the whole reason Chanel came back in the 50s was because sales of number five dipped and they wanted the publicity of Chanel staging collections to to 
you know, actually to shift more perfume, basically. Mm. So it's, it's, it's always been there. But I, I do think, you know, that you've, there are various questions. There are questions as to why people choose haute couture over ready to wear, which mm. I think is because fewer people do it, so you get more I publicity. Agree, yeah. um, but I, I think, but there are clients and it is selling. Um, so, you know, because then when you look at the amount of publicity that Dior gets or that Chanel gets, they could just stop doing couture. There's no reason for them to continue doing couture. Mm. They get enough from their ready to wear that, you know, and they're massive. I, I, I think the amount of, of publicity they get from that is, is negligible, but they do want to satisfy clients. Mm. It's a very difficult thing because I don't think there's a yes or no. no. It's not, well, this is for clients and this is for press, you know. Mm. It, it's, it's actually for all of those things and they all have a certain importance. Mm. But also the symbolic sanctity of, of haute couture itself, you know, the kind of desire to maintain it as, a, a, as an art form mm. is it, it, so important to these houses and especially, yeah, for the Chanel and Dior's, but also to people like Gautier. Mm. You know, I, I think, think it's it very important be, to France. To yeah, it's important couture, to France. And yeah. also to, to f probably to fight against things like you know, McQueen calling what they do couture. Mm. Because, you know, the the, the Chambre Syndicale rules are that haute couture can only be made in Paris. If you look at Margiela, they got taken off the, the couture calendar mm. because they said if you've, you have to preview, this has to be the first time you've shown the collection has to be during couture week. And if you previewed it somewhere else, you can't be on the couture calendar. Mm. That, you know, and that's why Margiela wasn't on it this season. Can we talk about Margiela? Because it was obviously the most exciting thing to happen to Alex Fury for about like <laughs> his entire life but it's interesting also just you know what did everyone make of, of him not showing as part of Couture Week and saying you know John Galliani saying I'm gonna show in London kind of on the last day of the menswear schedule and and buck trends in that way I'm interested to know what the reasons are what do you mean what what are you, what are you speculating the reasons are no uh, I can't say what I'm speculating the reasons are. you can no I can't Give us a hint. No. <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm sure there are reasons. I didn't necessarily think it was anything other than that he, he himself felt more comfortable to show in his hometown to an intimate audience who really wanted to show in London. I didn't, I was, I, I didn't think it was a, it was a, a purpose. Yes, more done personal, thing maybe. To move away from Paris mm. or to be taken off the Champs Underground, which I'm sure they're not happy about. I mean, I think the, the thing that I found interesting was the fact showing it in, in London because I think what it actually proved is the fact that where, wherever he'd shown, people would have gone to cover it because yeah. people came specifically to cover the couture from New York and then went back to New York. You know, they did, it's not like they stayed and did menswear. Mm. Um, so do you think it was a kind of a, a flexing of muscle in some ways? No, I think, I think there were probably lots of various reasons to do it. But I think one of the reasons, I don't think it was a, a flexing of muscle particularly. Mm. Um, but I, th you know, I think removing yourself from that environment probably removes yourself from a lot of, of kind of publicity, and so. Uh, but removes yourself from a lot of certain type of publicity, sure. and then again, showing it here, you got he got a lot of extra publicity. Yeah, a bit different. So I think there's, yeah, you know, I think there's there's various reasons. And what do we make of the the show itself? It's interesting that we were just talking about you know craft and the way dresses are made, and and that felt like something he was very keen to explore by actually sending the twirls down the runway, which was a really lovely aspect of the show. Um, what's your take on it, Shana? Well, I don't know, because I did the panel, didn't I? <laughs> and then I went away and I looked at them. Because we all said on the panel that we wanted well, to go I couldn't really see them more. and I wanted to crawl on the floor and I thought it would be <laughs> inappropriate. Um, uh, I mean, I do like it more than I liked it when I sat on the panel. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, you know, we were saying with Nick, it's like almost feels like not even like a preface, not even the yeah. first chapter. Um, and I like the way that it could be considered singularly um, mm. away from, you know, all the couture happens. And I'm not a journalist and I don't review shows, so I don't go. Mm. And um, I, you know, see it in bits and bobs and, you know, I read things that other people have written and check in on ones I'm interested in. 
But that one felt a moment and it had its own energy and conversation surrounding mm. it rather than, oh, and here's another one and that's Hips another one. one. Yeah. yeah. So I think it was special in that sense. I wonder how it lo would have looked on that note if you'd have seen it slap bang in the middle of Couture Week. How differently people would have viewed it or talked about it. I think that's a really interesting point. Well, that, that was the interesting for me because I, I wasn't at the show. I did go and see it in person in Paris. In Paris. And I felt like a lot of reviewers seemed to miss a lot of detailing about the show specifically. Mm. Yeah. And it, it felt like they had been swept up, uh, and understandably so, with the moment of Galliano coming back. Yeah. And, and it seemed like a lot of people's reviews revolved around that moment and then kind of glossed over a lot, a lot of things in the collection that I completely missed from A, these pictures. Mm. Like there were so many details, mm. especially in the back. Yeah. That mm. I, uh, completely, uh, the construction, certain, like lots of like deconstructed, actually that he did make, uh, um, retain uh, uh, some of the kind of artisanal traits of using old garments to turn into new, yeah. those kind of things. Uh, the faces, the masks, he had done all these kind of different um, tests to, to create these sort of hidden faces within the garments, all kinds of things that I kind of missed or people didn't flag up because you wrote about that Alex, and you wrote about Marjana being known for the mask and the fact that he put them on the clothes which is something he's yeah, done before you were the, you were yeah. the only one but that was the only one the clothes. Yeah. but I think but I was searching for that I think in other reviewers yeah well, I think the, the difficult thing it, and, and it, certainly yeah. with with what I wrote about it is was the fact that you have limitations of space and when it's to go into a newspaper you, they you know, want that's not the story they want yeah. but also you have to contextualize it for, for somebody that isn't a mem you know, that isn't part of the fashion audience, that isn't yeah. part of a fashion conversation. Yeah. And really it's, it's, I mean, what I felt looking at this show was, again, not to, to go into that old couture thing, but I, I did some maths and was <laughs> sort of like, if Gatliano had carried on working, we would have seen 35 collections by him by the time we hit that, including men's own pre-collection and his own label and Dior and couture. We essentially missed 35 collections. Um, and I feel like this felt like a collection that was trying to cram not 35 <laughs> collections worth of ideas, but was trying to cram four years worth of ideas into one, mm. which is why it, it feels like it's composed of these individual pieces um, rather than kind of a coherent message. Mm. And certainly when you compare it to, to previous artisanal collections, which have very much been about here is, here is the message, this is what we're doing this season, mm. this is, you know, this is the garment we're deconstructing and you know we're going to sew gloves we're going to sew footballs um you know it t there tends to be a sing single message and this was much more about that proposition of different ideas and maybe to see which will work and w which feels like it's gelling right for the moment mm. um mm. but artisanal uh, historically has always been its own thing and mm. i really do think that ready to wear will give us a much better idea of you know where Galliano is heading at Margiela. Mm. I don't know. It's always been its own thing, and actually, this, dis, you know, despite like the completely different appearance, it kind of c carries on in that vein for me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the thing I loved was seeing the twelves, and I, mm. I think what I wrote about it was that the, you know, Galliano shows us things that we've never seen before, and the twelves are the thing that you never get to see. Mm. It's, the th it's the thing that I would always love to see, and it's the thing that you never get to see. Mm. So to see those coming out like the kind of ghosts of the collection you've mm. just seen, um, there was something quite magical. And also, it was very difficult apparently to, to engineer the show because all the models walked one way and then walked back in the twelve at the end, and the whole team had to run around. <laughs> which was if anyone was searching for a justification for, for that venue I think that was the justification was it was a place they could build that so the team could run to the other end and change the models mm -hmm. um, but don't you think it was quite poetic I think actually following on from talking about process yeah. and how one exhibits that mm. I, I thought it was quite a curatorial idea actually yeah, yeah. What we would do is we'd be like, well, what have you got that tells the story? Have you got sketches? Have you got drawings? Have you got notes? Have you got photos? Have you got twirls? Great. And what he did was exhibited them at that moment. I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it shows you, it gives you an understanding of the work that goes into those pieces in a very different way, mm. like you've never seen before yeah. on the runway. I, it's also, I do think you can interpret it in lots of different ways. It's interesting that you say sort of the cu curatorial idea behind it, because I think you also, you know, people tied it to him and were like, oh, it's a very, you know, 
It's a very modest thing to do. It shows his respect for craft and his respect for mistakes. Other people saw it purely as an aesthetic thing. And I think that it was a, it was a really interesting thing for that respect because there were so many different takes that you could have. I, think it's quite, I, feel, I feel it's quite a fashionable yeah. process. Yeah, I think We're always is. talking at Somerset House, well, should we show the process? Or People are really genuinely interested and, mm. and new ways to make that more fascinating instead of showing a behind-the-scenes film yeah, exactly. um, is, is what you do here at Show Studio. I mean, mm. there's so many different strands of it, and I, I thought that was interesting and quite new. Mm. And I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. It was an appropriate gesture for Margiela as well, exactly, mm. the way yeah. the toils were also kind of like white washed in sort of white paint which is a very you know signature of the house mm. so, yeah so I, I think it kind of worked in many different ways but successfully and it and it's interesting how a lot of people pick that up as the most successful kind of element of, of the show mm. Mm. Or, or the most pleasing element mm. when you went to the showroom in in Paris did mm. they show you the toiles too no, they, they had them kind of they had them all kind of like sort of bunched up and in a in a corner and <laughs> you like, like see those. You're really setting the experience. Yeah. <laughs> I but actually maybe it made me appreciate like the, the main silhouettes at hand, you know, more because they were kind of displayed with like a lot of pomp and and, and, and they were explained very meticulously. There was just so many details that I just didn't what? see from, from yeah tell, from tell us some of them what really struck you from any of this like uh the the way the evening jackets the way the lining i don't know if you can go back up the lining pulled out of the sleeve so like you know when you have the lining of a, of a sleeve yeah and it's pulled out that's why it's draped like that can you see that kind of attached arm on yeah. the on the, on the right. right hand side it's it's the idea of a jacket sort of falling off the shoulder and like the lining kind of being pulled out. Oh, some, that's interesting. You kind of can't see, I think, here that the one on the left is a, an upside down pair of trousers as yeah, well. Yeah, the upside down um, pair of trousers. There were some garments that had a, like sort of vintage pieces worked into it. So kind of carrying on that idea that artis artisanal uses sort of existing vintage pieces. Um, I found the, the kind of shell test that he had done with like all these mm -hmm. shells you know, made up into different faces, kind of like um, African tribal masks. You know, really interesting. He, a lot of re a lot more research had gone in into this than actually I, I had mm. initially thought, and it, it made me look at the collection in a completely um, different way. The stockman uh, kind of coats, obviously a reference to you know the stockman pieces that Margella first you know mm. used in his yeah. uh, early shows. Uh, yeah, I what I found it really yeah kind of it, if I hadn't seen that I, I I would have gone on thinking maybe you know it wasn't a home run mm. as it were, mm. Mm. Uh, which a lot of people kind of ended up saying that it was you know it wasn't the blazing success that it could have been mm. but but it, we're glad to have him back that seemed to be mm. the general consensus yeah do you agree with that Alex? I think a lot of people wanted it to be an amazing thing that was going to blow everybody out of the water. I think a lot of people wanted it to be an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. I think actually what, what it became, I really think that it is, it's, it's a proposition mm. of, of the future rather than it being this kind of, it, you know, it isn't about ripping it apart and creating it anew, which I feel mm. is, is what John's debut at Dior was about, it was mm. very much about dismissing the old guard, ringing in something new, mm. trying to stage something in an entirely new way, looking, you know, looking at Dior's heritage in a new way. At that point it was the 50th anniversary of the new look. You know, it's very different in sense to that. It actually reminds me much more of his, um, his first own label show mm -hmm. um, from 1984 which even then they said was was about kind of a proposition mm. it was you know it was like a warning shot rather than an actual fully realized um collection mm. and that's sort of what i feel like this is it's about you know proposing different ideas which really is what is what couture is when i've spoken it's with different designers what raf did with his first season at dior as well i think actually it feels more appropriate now to kind of do things slowly and suggest things and develop them. Well, a lot of designers say that, you know, really a couture show is, is it's about a couture outfit on a model is a proposition to a client, which then the client can take and make their own. You know, they can mm. 
they can have it altered, they can have the colour change, they can, you know, make a long skirt into a short skirt. Um, you certainly see that with with some collections, you know, I, I wrote about Ellie Saab that occasionally it's like looking at an embroidery, um, an embroidery sample book and really what it's all about is these are the techniques that we have available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, come in and design your dress, decide which one you want to use, mm -hmm. decide which colour you want it in, mm -hmm. and then, you know, design it to suit your figure, you know, your cultural background, the country your palace is in, um, you know, that, that, and I think there's quite a lot of that in the couture, there are, you know, it's, it's about, which, which is kind of what I said earlier, it's about proposing technique, yeah. Which and to try and dazzle a client with, you know, this is, this is what we can do, mm. what do you want, mm. you know. Are there designers who make statements rather than propositions that could show, were there any this season? I think Victor and Rob was definitely a statement and obviously mm. in lieu of the fact that they've now kind of stopped their um, ready to wear. Like, you know what, I actually uh, really liked it for what it was, which is you know, a completely, you know, free, sort of freeing sort of statement. I, I don't think it was a sort of cynical move to, you know, sell more perfume, <laughs> despite the kind of fabrics being, you know, these floral fabrics. I thought it was them kind of continuing this interesting experiment of taking very cheap fabrics, like before it was latex and red kind With of terry, carpet, yeah. terry carpet, red carpet and it's using these kind of uh, Dutch wax fabrics, very cheap fabric and making them elevated. And I mm. think it was an interesting experiment to see. I don't know who's it for, um, other than I think an art museum has bought a few of them mm. already. Mm. So I think that's a good enough purpose if that's, if that's what they want to concentrate on, which is mm. maybe working more in that art field while selling some perfumes at the side. Mm. Yeah. I know Somerset House doesn't have a permanent collection, but do you always think about that when you look at the collection? It's obviously, you know, you have friends who are curators at places that do have collections and you've worked at some of those yourself. Do you look at the collections and think about it from that perspective as well? No, I've never had a permanent collection. Would you love one? Um, yeah, I'd be cool, <laughs> no? And beyond that, no, Somerset House isn't getting one. Um, <laughs> But no, I've never had that thought. I think that's a, 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 almost a strand of your job, yeah. which I've never had to think about. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I've never thought, okay, that really resembles what was happening now. So I think that would be really important. You know, some Oriole Cullen at the V&A must think, oh, well, we must have something that resembles that because that really is important moment. Mm. Um, but it went to... Um, the, uh, the, I thought the whole collection was going to the Boymans in Rotterdam. I thought they bought three of them. Oh, was it only three? Oh, maybe, maybe they bought more. Well, it mm. was an art collector bought it and then he was yeah. giving it to the Boymans and that's a very interesting museum. I think actually. he's bought a full collection before yeah. and this time he bought three. I, I, mm. I, I feel like I know, I, I've forgotten his name but I know who he is because mm. that's a very interesting museum. I what? can also see them popping up in like music videos or <laughs> or, re or on the red. I don't know. Like they, they so uh, for some reason I was drawn to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite you though. I it is quite yeah, me. you'd look yeah. good in it. <laughs> Tell us more about. You say it's a very interesting museum. I just want to know. I'm intrigued. Why? Why do you say that? Well, they've done some really interesting exhibitions. Judith Clark did an exhibition there called Installing Illusions, where it's about making connections with something in a specific space. Um, and yeah, it's it, it's it, it's that specific collector. I think I, might have just, I haven't got any of the information. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can't, I can't remember his name. Um, but I think um, if you exhibited them, you could tell many stories. So I think yeah. it's always interesting with any object. You could tell so many different stories. So. Mm -hmm something like this on the eve of them saying they're no longer making ready to wear they put this out why did they put that out mm. um they use cheap fabrics it's a flower was it about their flower perfume flower mm. bomb yeah um etc 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 so i i almost feel with me because i'm a bit social historian at heart there's never not a good story about a piece of clothing mm. you always find one so I, maybe i'd be terrible 
in charge of a collection. <laughs> you just I just have everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just be collecting it all. But it is interesting to think about fashion in the context of, of something that is as valid if it only ever ends up in a museum and never ends up being worn or you know, purchased by a, a client, no matter how much it's tweaked. I think that's something that was interesting. You know, it's a shame because she's now focusing on her ready to wear, but there's kind of the new guard of couture when Iris Van Herpen kind of was doing that and really mm. pushing and that was kind of the avenue that I think she went down when most of her clothes were viewed in the context of an exhibition or a performance which is really interesting because she was part of this new guard but then there's other people in the new guard who are totally the opposite who are much more about sort of the pragmatic nature of wearing couture which is people like Boucher Jara yeah, which is really yeah. interesting did you go see the collection yeah I did and I still yeah, I, I, I do think what she does is really consistent, you know, in her approach to haute couture, which is that haute couture doesn't need to be this, you know, spectacle and it doesn't need to be this like kind of almost untouchable um, garment. And the only danger is that it can, like, where do, where's the distinction then? Why? Mm. Because she also does do ready to wear, I believe. Mm. Mm. So, and the distinction is kind of, you know, it's really blurred, like, where does haute couture begin and ready to wear, mm. you know, end. Um, but I still, I, I do think there is a place for her kind of haute couture within, within haute couture because, mm. because of the customer, and, and I think it is really tailored towards a customer, would demand that. Mm. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> Expand. <laughs> What's your thought Would on you that? <laughs> no, I think it's, it's just it's quite odd looking at these different collections because they're really they're very different. You can't compare. It's the like whole thing is, is really disparate, mm. um, and you look at you know I look at this and it feels like it's about satisfying the need of a very specific type of woman, but about satisfying the need of a very you know of her. Mm. With Victor and Rolf, it feels like it's almost like satisfying the need of themselves. Um, and I know we talk about couture as being these kind of big, extravagant, you know, unreal things. But I, I kind of feel like there should be some sort of reality. I'm not sure there is a reality to what Victor and Rolf do, and I think maybe that's my slight issue with it. Did you not like the Victor and Rolf collection? No, I, I felt like it was very much, a, you know, for something that was so three dimensional, it was very oddly two dimensional. Mm. Um, and with, you know, I can see the reality to some things. I, you know, you can even see the reality to some of the very extreme things that, that you know, Lee McQueen and, and John did. I was surprised. I went to Kerry Taylor and there was a look from one of what, what I would consider to be Lee's most um, extreme Givenchy collections, which was a collect dissect that had, you know, dead animal parts in it. Mm. Um, and there was a, a coat that had been ordered by a client that, you know, that that was now being offered for sale. Mm. Um, I think maybe with Victor and Rolf, because it was quite so one note, mm. that's why I had difficulty seeing, you know, it, it appealing to somebody. Does everybody understand when I say it, it doesn't have a hook for me? Mm. Mm. It could be cute, it's kind of fun. I liked it as a flowers. cathartic exercise, maybe, which, which is how I see it for them, because they've had this sort of, because they're ready to wear, you know, when they did begin, had such concept, everything had a concept. Yeah. Yeah. And then slowly, obviously, that, you know, that disappeared when mm. they, you know, came under commercial constraints. And now they've realised, you know, they want to go back to doing concept. And yeah. I think it's a, it's a good exercise. But I didn't this feel like it good had enough of it, because I loved the red carpet collection that they did. I thought that was incredibly intelligent, incredibly humorous. And yeah. the is so about red carpet dressing, and then they, and then they yeah. made carp dresses out of carpet. I mean, it's very, you know, it's, it's one note in a different way. I thought that was clever, because this was about Van Gogh, you know, and I was like, oh, Van Gogh. And I, again, I just felt kind of, you looked at it, and you were like, oh, yeah. Like, it's really obvious, it didn't feel clever mm. in the way that, that that red carpet collection did feel clever. Even though it, it was, was obvious. It was obvious and unwearable, but it, you mm. know, it was kind of funny and yeah. a bit of a pun. Yeah. Whereas I didn't find this funny or a bit of a pun, you know, and it, it, it's very elaborate, but I guess it's, it's, you know, when you're showing in couture, everybody's dresses yeah. are very mm. elaborate. You know, mm. Jean-Paul Gaultier weaves a dress out of ribbons. Chanel, you, you know, makes these amazing dresses out of kind of, flowers and embeds feathers in them you know mm. everything is amazing you've got to 
you've got to do something mm. absolutely incredible. Mm. And this kind of wasn't enough. It wasn't amazing enough, mm. which when you're looking at a dress that two models can't pass on the catwalk together because their heads and their head pieces and their dresses are too big, it's odd to say it didn't feel enough, but it mm. really didn't feel enough for me. Mm. Um, I'm probably like reading like too much in the depth in, into that fabric as well, because it's like this specific real Dutch wax fabric that we all think of as an African fabric. It mm. really isn't, it, mm. it, you know, it's like made yeah. in Amsterdam and, and, it, and it's kind of obviously, you know, Dutch connections. And I, I don't know, I, I found it charming yeah. as, a, as a collection and c good for them that they, they're sort of trying to exercise these sort of commercial constraints, you know, these demons inside them maybe. Mm. Mm. They're try you know, they're trying to get back onto track as to where they want to go where they want to, and what they want to say what they want to be as yeah. designers let's yeah. move from this to Jean Paul Gaultier because he's done mm. a very similar thing you know as Alex pointed out which is to say you know I'm going to stop doing the ready to wear I'm going to focus on my couture and obviously you know mm. it was interesting because this this happened you know it's like a couple of days after he's doing this big collaboration with East Pax so he's obviously is going to keep making kind of accessible stuff that you can buy but probably through collaborations with like stores or other brands yeah because his name is still so powerful and he can kind of leverage that to do yeah. many collaborations. I thought this collection was really wearable, dare I say? Yeah, mm. yeah. I also thought it was very okay, clever. Really Again, in that we were talking about, you know, cleverness, I thought it was very clever. The fact that, you know, people often say, well, if you're going to spend a couture amount on a dress, you're going to spend it on mm. your wedding dress. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's a thing in Colin McDowell's book that lots of clients ordered the dresses from John Galliano's first Dior collection in white to wear them as wedding dresses mm -hmm. and that's why he did really good business um, so I, I kind of I, I love the fact that he played on those couture tropes mm -hmm. and called it 61 ways to say yes and then mm -hmm. you know the, it was it was for me it was also interesting to see the audience reaction because really it was kind of like okay so Gautier is the only you, you, or Gaultier is the big French couturier, he's still showing on the Paris schedule, mm. and they kind of lionised him as the new Yves Saint Laurent. It mm. was, you know, I've, I've never been in a show where people were just spontaneously clapping all the way through it, <laughs> and cheering, and throwing bouquets onto the catwalk. Which were left on our seats. Yes. Handy. Handily. Mm -hmm. um, Did you throw your bouquet? I didn't throw mine. I was scared <laughs> it was going to hit somebody, so I thought... Yeah, I just not. thought, I kept thinking, I'll throw it, she'll stand on it. She'll fall into the audience. She'll hit me. Um, you know, it'll be my fault. Yeah. Um, but no this worries. was this was kind of for me. I really like this collection. It, it felt like it had a real soul to it. Yeah. And it mm. was really. I, I like it when, particularly with Ghost here, when he's really gleeful. Mm. He felt like he, you know, really enjoyed doing this. There were eighties models. Yeah, mm. a lot know. of that had to do with the casting, though. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. Stephen yeah. Jones talked about that. He sent us a little note on his shows of the season. He said, "I loved all the loved all the girls. Violetta Sanchez modelling again." And he said he still knows how to bring the house down, which is very sweet. It was very cute. It is interesting, also, what you're saying, Alex, about it being kind of smart commercially, because. I think it's an interesting time for him because there is a lot of focus on him, partly because of that announcement, but also just because he's got this big touring exhibition. You know, we were mm. talking. Is it still going? Yeah, mm. I think so. Where is it going? It's in, it was in Australia. It comes to Paris this year. Yeah. So actually, that's kind of I the big it's thing. The culmination. Those yeah. Poor clothes. I know they've been everywhere. Yeah. But you think how much press he's got at the moment. It's like if ever there was a time to do a collection that you can really sort of sell lots of. Um, but no, it was really beautiful. Really nice. Should we talk also, I'd like to talk about Scaparelli because that was an interesting one because obviously they are without a designer at the moment. Mm. Um, did you like what Marco Zanini did there, Susie? I was a bigger fan of him at Rochas. I, I do think you could sense the tension between him and the organisation, the owners of Scaparelli from the, right from the get-go. So I wasn't actually that surprised when it was announced that he was leaving. Um, but I did like what he did, you know, it was very charming, but I think the, not, the problem with, you know, the, this kind of reboot of Scaparelli is, you know, they seem to have gone, like, right from the beginning, they've said, you know, we're going to do Scaparelli codes, and things tend to get very literal, and it has been quite literal, like, de definitely in this collection, yeah. and even in the ones that um, Zanini did. And I don't necessarily think that is the best approach for a house that 
really has no resonance like in you know the public consciousness like how like if you walked out of the street and asked people what Scaparelli was who Scaparelli was they wouldn't know and that it's a real opportunity for someone to come in and do something you know yes looking back at the past but to educate people to educate yeah. people, but to do something really fresh and exciting mm. and I don't necessarily think it's it's been there and now that they don't have a designer it's even kind mm. of more of a, a sort of bobbing boat in the sea mm. you know I don't know yeah. how you feel about I mean I think yeah. the thing that I don't think actually Marco exploited and the thing that that they have that so few houses have is that they have this they have a silhouette they've got their equivalent to the Chanel jacket to the Dior bar jacket they've got that broad shouldered mm. um, evening jacket with a long skirt you know mm. that Elsa Scaparelli invented that she invented that 30 mm. silhouette they, you'd see them peppered through that. the collection but it wasn't but, but the thing is that you can own that yeah. and I think with with Marco you saw him injecting himself into it mm. and with this collection it was far too much of a tick sheet of yeah. this is remember this remember this remember Scaparelli did zips here's a big zip remember you know Scaparelli did but skeletons here's a dress with skeletons on the thing, outside who does remember like there mm. is like yeah. a, a handful of people like True. you and I that will, will know that and and to take a brand to and yes okay it's a couture brand they're not doing ready to wear they don't have to like resonate with like as many people Mm. I still think you know it's kind of like a lost opportunity I think as well for considering the fact that they themselves harp on about how important you know how singular Elsa Scaparelli was to take away the one person that was leading the design team and to say well this is all about this one woman here's a team doing you know that's not the way it should be one person leading Who would you like this to see there? I don't know I liked what Marco Zanini was doing. I don't think he was given enough time. Yeah. Mm. I think when you look at what Marco did, he did a lot of new things that were actually echoes of what he did at Rochus. Mm. You know, there was a softness to what he was doing. Um, and not enough freedom as well as time. Yeah, I feel I feel like there was that need to give it this this Scaparelli handwriting, but there was a very distinct idea of what they thought a Scaparelli handwriting was. Yeah, mm -hmm. not And that actually what it should be is Marco Zanini telling the Scaparelli story with his handwriting. Uh, and he also knows loads about Scaparelli, which was yeah. a weird thing, because it felt like you're being like, no, obsessive. that's not Scaparelli, this is Scaparelli. It was, mm. it was weird. It, 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 you know, it feels, I think they, I hope they don't think it's a good idea to continue with a design team doing it, because I don't think it is. I think particularly when a house is so founded on one individual's individual taste mm. to try and assimilate that with a team you know design by committee never works yeah it needs an individual to really steer its design course mm. like I, I i mean and i do think they need to kind of steer it away from just literal rehashing mm. of archives mm. It's interesting though because when it kind of all relaunched and it all happened, there was talk of there being so many different kind of collaborations with people, you know, like they did with Lacroix when they yeah. first started. Which I loved, I loved that. Yeah, and none of it's really materialised, has it? I think with this, Jean Paul Goud did the set, yeah. which might have been interpreted as one of those moments. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I, you get the feeling that they just don't really know what to do with it. Yeah. And that now they're like, well, we should carry on doing couture, because I assume they wouldn't do a couture collection. But I, I, I feel like they've just n absolutely no idea where they want Scaparelli to go. And that's, I'm like, what you need to figure out is what you want to say and who you want to say it. That's really yeah. what you've got to do. Mm. You know, get somebody in, figure it out. Mm. It, you know, it's not that difficult. You've got to have faith and you've got to give them time. So who could do it now that uh, we've all said that it's a shame with Marco Zanini, but who could do it? I kind of think Mary. I think Mary would be good. Contrance, you could do a good job. Interesting. Not just saying that because she's Alex's chum. Um, but, she, yeah, she's, uh, some people have suggested... She's definitely got, a, I, what I think is kind of under, under mentioned about Mary is the wit that her clothes often have. Mm. And, and I wit think is so important. So important, but also yeah. kind of not forced wit, not like gimmicky wit. And I think it's got to be funny, but not a gag. Exactly, yeah. and she's really. I think you know, recent seasons perhaps have been less ha ha than previous ones. But you know, I always think of like the typewriter dresses and stuff. Like she's very good at being very funny, but in a way that's still very covetable, which I think is one of the things that. Mm. And I think as well, they've got to decide if they want it to be. You know, do 
do they want Scaparelli to have a ready-to-wear base? Do they want to yeah. relaunch the perfume? Is it just going to be, you know, couture? Is it going to be demi couture? You know, what the person that did it best, I, and I did. I really liked what Marco Zanini was doing. I liked the direction he was going in. But I, you know, what Christian Lacroix did was the best. Mm. But also, you got the feeling this was the collection Lacroix had wanted to do for like thirty years, mm. um, and he himself said that he wouldn't have come out of retirement to do it for anybody else other than mm. Elsa Scaparelli. Mm. And even when he looked at it, he looked at it as if he was costuming a stage play about Elsa Scaparelli's life, which I thought was an incredibly clever way of looking at it. Mm. Because in a sense, it becomes again about the singular, but it's not about you as a designer, it's about her as a woman. Mm. Um, and he said he was thinking about Catherine Hepburn as Coco mm. in, in, the, in the Broadway play, and if they did one on Elsa, mm. this is, as a costume designer, which he is now, this mm. is how he would dress her. Mm. Um, which, you know, but he's incredibly clever. And Scaparelli was such a huge source of inspiration. It would be great if they could find somebody that had that sort of synergy mm. with Elsa Scaparelli, who isn't, you know, very much known outside of the fashion world, but I think mm. a lot of people have a lot of passion for her. Um, so it would be interesting She's such a to designer's see. design. It's interesting, you know, Susie, what you said really astutely, you know, like, but who knows that she did the zips? Who knows she did the skeleton? The thing is, like, everyone in fashion, see, there are, there's an untapped yeah. resource of all these people who are obsessed with her, and you think, you know, give one of them a shot, don't you? It's but she also had a massive amount of bravery, and she wasn't af af afraid to shout something that everybody else would be like, what? What yeah. are you talking about? Um, massive rivalry with Chanel, hated her, thought she was mm. horrible. <laughs> she was so rude outwardly, and you can see that in her clothes as well. You know, collaborating with Dali, mm. the, the artist of the time, you know, that was really important. She was deeply involved in what was going on at that moment in time. So I actually think, interestingly, someone with that spark and energy and yeah. almost fingers up would be really cool to be there because to create their own Scaparelli of our time conversations yeah. because That's a really interesting way of also about that. I've been thinking a lot about relationships I, I love that period of time you know yeah. that she was working and Chanel was working and their relationship with with those artists is really interesting you know Chanel's collaborations for Belarus you know mm. Picasso's doing the set I think they were a gang, weren't they? But what's our gang? Like, what's yeah. the equivalent? I, I just wonder about it. Maybe I can't see it because, you know, it's now. Um, mm. And maybe that's quite nostalgic. You never know with history yeah. and what's been rewritten and, you know, what bits you pick up and find really important. But they were 10 years apart. Or, um, But I, I don't know. John Paul Good is quite cool, mm. I guess. But it feels more of the moment I think it's would so be someone inter quite interesting yeah I don't know who that is you know <laughs> because you say she had such a finger on the pulse and she was yeah. so interested in culture and this this just is another She's reason why it's, it feels so outside of everything it doesn't feel like it relates to anything or like it's kind of in the know or anything like that which is well kind of goes back to that question is do we need to be reviving all these mm. old houses and yeah. are we letting the designers of our time speak for themselves yeah. you know that, that that's like another question altogether well it was interesting because of the vna thing which you know was like kind of revolving doors and then yeah vna i mean there, there was talk of god is it is it Poirot? Poirot? Yeah. Poirot, yeah were they gonna revive that one but that is it has it was sold in um yeah. it was offered for sale in december and I think it was charles Charles James. Charles James. Charles James. Oh, I yeah. mean, it ran out of steam up with you. That was like Charles. <laughs> it's just I don't know. I question whether they all, all these names need to be need to be revived. Scaparelli, mm. though, uh, you know, absolutely. But with a lot of them, it's it's things like you know, with with Poiret, the reason that was being revived. I, I spoke with the the investment guys that 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 are reviving it, the investment house in in Switzerland. Um, and they're reviving it because they've collected all of the trademarks together. So whoever buys it, buys the name for fashion and buys the name for the perfumes and buy, you know, so they have a package of a fashion house that they can then license. Yeah. And I think that's when, you know, that's what, it's, it's not really about selling couture, which is why I, I kind of don't really understand Scaparelli. Like, why haven't you relaunched the perfume? Like, if, mm. you know, if, if you're, if you want to sell this, get a designer in to make clothes that people want to buy. Mm. Because nobody wants to buy this. 
and it's not working as a PR exercise. So I really don't understand what yeah, the point kind is. Kind of, what's the point? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't get it. But I as well, with you know, it's 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 Diego della Valle, and, and I think what he's done with Todd's and with Alessandro Facinetti there is very clever, which is mm. to give you know. Todd's was known as a company that produced driving moccasins and a bag called the D-Bag, which I think is really poorly titled. Um, and <laughs> But she's managed to spin it out and give it a ready-to-wear identity. And I think that's very clever, actually. You know, th these clothes mean something in that landscape of Italian fashion. And really what, what you want Scaparelli to have is a contemporary relevance. Mm. And it doesn't. So if you want to sell perfume, get the perfume out there. There's a lot of people we haven't talked about we haven't talked about Yolanda Sienko, we haven't really talked about um, Dabasita Bali, there's lots of people we haven't discussed. I haven't talked um, about Versace. Oh, okay. we haven't talked about Versace. Okay, let's talk about Versace. Did you like it, Alex? No. <gasps> I didn't. Why not? I like. You love Versace. <laughs> my favourite, and I'm going to say this because I started a, um, a couture report with it. As I was walking out, there was um, a member of the Versace couture team um, and a client walking out together um, and I didn't hear what the couture aide said to the woman but she'd obviously asked her if she liked the show and the woman replied well I mean that beaded that beaded see-through shit it was sexy as fuck which isn't something you hear at the couture very often and also that was the best part of the collection mm. the best part of the collection was when it was really really pushed um, and really extreme and it was the beaded see-through shit at the end mm. that was sexy as fuck mm. but I think you know, there was an admirable idea, which was the idea of cutting an entire couture collection without curves. It was a technical experiment. Oddly, Donatella talked about it being a laboratory for ideas, the way that Scaparelli talked about mm. couture. Um, but I, I really think that you, you got really lost in the technique. You mm. kind of just wanted to pull everything straight. Like, every scene doesn't have to be bendy. <laughs> like, let's just pull it all straight. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the beaded dresses at the end, I think they worked really well. Mm. You know, you could, again, you could see where it's going to end up. It, it was very weighted towards evening wear. Mm. It actually registers incredibly well online. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. as I sort of said before, Donatella Versace said that they get a lot of couture clients who see it online and order it. It's the reason she started to do shows again was, was to feed the internet with imagery of couture. And also she's mm. then seen that there's been an uptake in terms of orders from clients seeing it who aren't at the show. Um, but but for me as, as a collection, it felt like it, it was hit and miss. Mm. Um, you know, it was very, very Versace. I think yeah. that's it, it do, it's, it's unmistakable. Mm. It wasn't trying to be anything else, mm. uh, which I think is really great. But I, I think it, it got wrapped up in, in all of that technique, sure. as opposed to just making really sexy clothes. Mm. And that's sort of Versace's yeah, maybe niche. Maybe that's the point that she was saying, she was talking about it like a laboratory of ideas. Maybe that was the point where she didn't care that it was a bit hit miss. She wanted to try something out rather than just... But that's not very Versace and that's not very Donatella. I think mm. she's actually incredibly pragmatic. And, and, you know, she wants to make clothes that... I remember talking to her at one point, she was like, I'm never going to do pleated trousers because you do pleated trousers, you're going to look fat. Like, <laughs> she's a woman, she knows that. She's like, and if I do a big square shape, on the top, the bottom is going to be tight because otherwise you're going to look really fat. Like you know, she's she's really honest and really normal. I'm she's really, basically describing really, every outfit I wear. That <laughs> but she just you know, I like the fact that she has that. She's like, well, no one's going to wear this. It doesn't look right. Um, I've got to say that it looks kind of alluring though when you're kind of scrolling, really well, scrolling yeah. up and down like this. Those seams, but. I mean, it's such a tricky thing to kind of master, like in person, like when they're moving on the body and they're sort of like, you know, warping a little bit, like because they're so tight. Whereas like when you see it, like kind of from the front on, actually they look quite, you know, quite beautiful. Yeah. You know, just like the curves, like just the lines being drawn on the, on the body. I, do, do you know what? I really like it for what it is. I. I feel like this is couture that serves a real purpose mm. and there are many women that you know would would like Alex says just order a dress you know on the back of these pictures alone yeah and that's a really powerful thing considering mm. haute couture is supposed to be this like one-on-one -on -one, you know um, atelier um, vendors experience mm. well I think you know the, the idea like, again because I've talked with her quite a lot about this you know she said the idea that they will see it and then they come and experience it in person and they're like you know god it's even better that's mm. the whole idea is, is to see it online and it's look one way and then see it and be like 
oh, I didn't realise it was, you know, I didn't realise these were all microscopic sequins, I didn't realise that was crocodile, I didn't realise mm. this crocodile cult was lined in shaved mink, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of, to pushing it so there's a digital experience and a real life experience as a client as opposed to ha as somebody just mm. viewing it as a picture. That's also interesting, yeah. But it's, it's, you know, it's a very modern way, it's like mm. kind of the way that people used to send out, you know, sketches, they used to send out croquis, which were like these sketches mm. with a swatch of fabric, now people do that on style.com, that's mm. what clients are ordering from. Mm. It's interesting that you said you know, it looks very, very Versace and it's interesting to go back to something you said earlier, Alex, which was this notion you know, that everything we've gone through as we've flicked through the different collections, everything looks totally different. And you know, to sort of wrap things up, I want to kind of question, is that a good thing that you know, Couture is so, so different and so dynamic in the sense that everyone's got these complete different perspectives? Or did it make, going back to what I asked right at the start, did it make it kind of a confusing season to analyse? It's hard to know whether people, you know, we talked about it, whether people were focusing on reality or wanting to be escapist or wanting to be pragmatic or wanting to be you know, full of fantasy. It, it's a hard one to go, this is the mood. Well, I think in the, if you think about, I always think about Couture in the 80s, because it's great, um, but in the 80s there was this real polarisation. There was a boom in Couture, but, but the boom actually coincided with a polarisation away from smaller Couture houses. So a lot of the smaller houses got starved into extinction mm. um, because people wanted a Dior dress, wanted a Chanel dress. Mm. They wanted a dress that had that 80s designer name attached to it mm. as well as couture workmanship. And I think we still see the legacy of that today. Yeah. And I think that's the trouble with something like Scaparelli. It's, it's trying to find its validity because it's not enough to just make a black jacket. You've got to make something that's yours and that people are going to choose you mm over Dior or over Chanel. You know, I think that's, and really when we look at, at the couture landscape, it's about people trying to do something that can't be equaled by the other houses. It's about people trying to kind of, you know, define their niche and appeal to their specific customers. Because you're not gonna, you're not gonna get loads and loads of customers. Um, and you're not gonna, you know, if somebody wants to shoot a, a Jean-Baptiste Valley dress, they're not going to shoot a Versace dress. It's you know they're two mm. completely different aesthetics. Those you know, so I, th mm. I think it's it's about I think couture always ends up being about designers doing what they do really well. Mm. And that's when it's really good as opposed to people all trying to do the same thing, or as opposed to you know people all trying to do what Dior did, mm. or people all trying to do what um, Givenchy did, or something like mm. that. Well, occasionally you get those seasons where everyone's following the fashionable yeah. ideal. Um, and this was one where that wasn't happening? No, I think yeah. it's a very disparate... I don't think... Personally, I didn't think it was a particularly strong season. Mm. I didn't go away. I wasn't... My mind wasn't particularly blown by anything. Mm. Um, but I think as well, maybe that's because people were focusing on that kind of workmanship. And if mm. I was thinking about buying something, my mind would be blown away that they can weave lace like that, mm. that, you know, Valentino can embroider a dress like that, that... Um, Chanel can, you know, Chanel has artisans that can physically make these kind mm. of things. That was sort of mind blowing, but you didn't come away struck by there being a new silhouette or a new mood, or, you know, you, I didn't feel like it moved couture. For instance, comparing it with last spring summer, where I feel like Chanel and Dior were really about, okay, so let's address what couture has to be in the 21st mm. century. You know, it's got to be the couture version of a trainer has to be the whole outfit like the whole mm. outfit has to breathe it has mm. to move it has to be weightless you know i felt like that was an incredibly dynamic proposal for mm. couture um and this season we got flowers <laughs> you know it's not as it's not the same sort of thing that's fine do you agree with that season, Shona? it's whether how we want to look at Oak couture is it for us like as the journalists looking for innovation or like a trend story to work on Mm. Or is it for you know the prestige of the houses and the artisans mm. that work for them? Is it for the client? I mean, these questions like we ask it every season about haute couture. But maybe that's why this was good. It made us ask all those questions again. Yeah, and I, I kind of do like that. You know, th this season, like it was sort of quite like disparate, and and uh, mm. you know, and maybe because there are so few of them on the schedule as well that you remember every single one so clearly and they're all very distinctive from mm. one another. Yeah, they don't blur together at all. Um, and that's, you know, I think that that's right, that each house is kind of asserting what it's good at, what it can do, what it can achieve. And, um, you know, 
successfully or not successfully in our minds. You know, it's not up to us to say, it's actually up to the clients, I mm. think. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think it's it's, it's difficult for, for me to say because, mm. you know, you could do an exhibition on any of these design houses and you tell all the different stories. So I think it's, it's moments in their time mm. and I think that's always interesting. Would it be hard to do a, a modern couture exhibition? You know, we had, you know when the b and did the Golden Age of Couture, would it be hard to do something like that today, do you think, just because, as we've all said, they are all so different? No, I think you probably could. You just have to group it together in a way that worked for you. It's like yeah. anything, you could tell so many different stories. Would it be about the feathers you used in one section mm. or would it be about a certain tailoring technique mm. that only couturiers um, employ and, and Le Petit Man make? Um, uh, uh, no, or it could be the clients that buy it. <laughs> I know, I'd love to do that. Yeah, you'd but be good at that. <laughs> I would, yeah. <laughs> Apparently they, you know, they didn't want to stand up and talk about that, but some do. Um, no, I think you could, you, you could, you can group anything together, really. Mm. Um, no, it'd be a good, good show. It's good they surprised us all, though, isn't it? It's nice to always see people, well, maybe not surprise us, it's good to see that everyone's kind of doing what they do best. And I think it's, in a way, it's good that when the ones, the shows you don't like, it's because they did, they weren't doing that. Mm. And I think that's always, it's a nicer way to not like something because they didn't feel like they were doing what they do best well enough, if that makes sense. Should we give them all of a round of applause to wrap things up? Yay. <laughs>